Hello True Believers, welcome to my channel Mr. Miracle Comics, my name is Dave and today we have five more undervalued comics for us to take a look at. So first of all, uh, we won't spend a lot of time in the preamble, we got a good list today and we'll get right into it. Uh, the Loki sh uh, streaming show on Disney is eminent now. Um, today is the 28th, so it'll be you know just over a week, a week and a half until uh, the first one drops, which is great. Everybody's going to be super excited, I think. There could be some really crazy stuff going on in that show, and they may uh, very well like ha you know be specking on stuff like crazy, you know, depending what happens. I've already seen even in the trailers, there's already produced a lot of spec on that show, and there's some odd things going on in the background. Uh, one thing that looks kind of like it could be a Kang the Conqueror kind of jigsaw together. Now we know Marvel and Disney change their trailers. They add stuff or take stuff out. Uh, we saw this with Avengers Infinity War where the trailer didn't actually reflect uh, what was happening in the scene in the movie. Um, right, they do that as, you know, just to misdirection, right? Not let everything out of the bag just in a trailer or whatever. So who knows what that symbol in the background could actually turn out to be. Uh, but it does look like it could be some sort of Kang symbol. And Kang does have a lot to do with the Time Variance Authority, obviously being a time traveler, screwing with the timeline. Uh, the Time Variance Authority has a special interest in Kang the Conqueror. We also know, because of Loki, that you can have multiples of the same character because of time travel, right? They diverge in our timelines. Uh, one Loki, he died at the hands of Thanos. Another one uh, split off from that timeline, and he's the guy that the show was going to send around when he took the test rack and disappeared. Kang would also have this problem, right? Every time he jumped around, uh, there would be another iteration of Kang somewhere, right? And this would it, they kind of, you know, smartly brought that into the comic book. And they bring it in kind of that idea um, more here in Avengers, or from 1986, it's Avengers number 267, right? Which has the first appearance of the Council of Kangs. So, yeah, he's had some uh, ideas, like there's Kang Prime, and then Mortis, and Ramatot, right? So he knows that there can be multiples, and they're different entities, and they change, you know, and they, and they affect their timeline differently, and have different personalities, and all kinds of stuff. But here is he realizes that he's making many multiples, and they're all like a multiple of him, kind of varied, right? Uh, so the Council of Kangs, they're a group of Kangs that get together and kind of, you know, two heads are better than one kind of deal and think up evil plots to help Kang Prime and stuff. But he, Kang Prime also gets the idea that there's too many Kangs out there now in his idea. And, you know, he wants to off all the, yeah, the extra Kangs and become the only Prime Kang. Um, anyway, that uh, Council of Kangs first appears here in um, 1986. And I think, you know, with these streaming shows, if Kang does show up, we could see multiple ones. We could very well see Kang talking to himself or himself in the Council of Kangs. So uh, this book can be found in mint condition for five bucks to ten bucks. It's a, a, you know, I would figure a reasonable price for a really, really nice condition one. Um, it's not that hard of a book to find. I wouldn't go rushing out on eBay and try and buy up a bunch of these. And yeah, so from 1986, it's Avengers 267. First appearance of the Council of Kangs. Look to pay somewhere around five to ten dollars. All right, so continuing on that vein, and you know, I like to keep things kind of in groups so that you can, you know, if you're looking through stuff, uh, you can find them together. And that is uh, from 1988. We're gonna jump up a couple of years, and we're gonna go with Avengers. 292 and this book has the first appearance of the council of cross time kangs different group of kangs they don't have kang prime's best interest in heart they're kind of trying to thwart his plans uh that's what the cross town or time council of kangs does uh there's also in here the first appearance of what's called the kang Corps, um, where there's like hundreds of kangs and now kang prime realizes uh, they kind of go to this place called uh, the Kang Crossroads, right? So at one point, all these timelines kind of touch in this one spot, and all Kangs eventually travel through this one uh, sort of nexus point, and they call it the, uh, you know, the Kang Crossroads. And there's he gets there, and there's literally hundreds of these Kangs, right? Different races, different stuff. 
this book also has the first appearance of the female Kang. Uh, she's called um, Nebula in this book. I don't think they'll call her that in the show because, or if they had her in a show, just because it would be confusing with the Nebula character that already exists. Um, she is a Kang. So, but, and they later kind of retcon her into being uh, Ratova, the Kang's girlfriend from Avengers 23, but that was kind of a later retcon. But this is the first appearance of the actual female Kang iteration of her. And so I think that could be important. If we see female Kang show up in a property, uh, this book could be uh, suddenly have a little bit more attention paid to it, right? And see a rise in price. Um, same price for this book, looking into the 5 to $10 range for a near mint copy of it. Uh, probably can even find it cheaper. Not a super hard book to go out and find just uh, in you know real life rather than j jumping on eBay or whatever. Uh, lots of these kind of lots of these books were are still floating around out there. Nobody's paying attention to this guy. This one isn't even listed on Key Collector properly uh, as that first appearance, and um, yeah, so it could uh, could sneak in there if people start to pick up on what the Cross Time Council of Kangs and Kang Corp and Kang as uh, you know as a female. So good spec, I think. Um, so from 1988. Avengers 292 look to pay about five to ten dollars for this guy Okay, so we're gonna move up. We're gonna go way up. Actually, this is probably The newest book I've ever specced on in my channel, but I like it. I like this as a spec book um, It only came out last year and I'm gonna pick from 2020 Captain Marvel the end Right, so I love this cover really great cover, right? Um, in this book we have now I know it's like a alternate reality kind of book right where this is where Captain Marvel sacrifices herself to save uh, Earth and such um, there's some first appearances of brand new characters and again we like to spec on these young characters the young Avengers stuff coming up um, we're looking here Marvel said they're going to put out five streaming shows and five theatrical releases a year. That's what their goal is, right? In the next 10 years, that makes, sorry, that makes 100 properties listed out. And if you think that each one of those, like at minimum, is going to have one or two characters, right? We could be looking at, you know, 200, you know, if they have many, many characters being introduced, we could be up, you know, 250, 300 uh, characters introduced into the MCU over the next 10 years, right? So they, I, I think they want a lot of these characters to kind of come in from the newer fans, right? You want to keep your fans fresh, not just bring in the old guys like me, but bring in all those new fans as well into the movies who have seen stuff. And I really like the idea of some of these uh, characters' children that make their first appearance in here, um, like uh, Rhodes, first, uh, um, Rhodes' daughter, Carol Rhodes, uh, that's her first appearance in here. Katie Barton, who's Hawkeye and Black Widow's kid. Um, Gerald Drew has Spider Woman's kid in it. Uh, Irene LeBeau, which I believe is Rogue and Gambit's kid. I mean, I know, like I said, it's all like fantasy stuff, but they can pick from anywhere in these Marvel universe. And I think they're going to, you know, pick a lot more of these modern characters, bring in these new readers so that the characters that they like to are on the, on the screen. Uh, not just all these Bronze Age, Silver Age guys that, you know, Copper Age, but bring in these modern characters. So I like this as a spec book. I know it's new and, you know, a lot of the people who watch my channel are like, oh, a new book. But, you know, I mix it in here and we'll give you uh, this one new because I think it's uh, still a good deal. Um, Captain Marvel, The End. Uh, I, could, I found this one for 20 bucks, right, at, um, uh, off eBay. So I paid shipping on top of that as well. But... Uh, yeah, I've seen it on eBay, you know, a reasonable price for a nice copy of this is raw, you know, 25 to 35 bucks is probably about right. Um, if any of these characters come up, these modern books tend to really rise really fast. Uh, it just kind of shows that, um, they're low print, low, much lower print runs than copper age or even, you know, bronze and silver age books. And uh, there are a lot of brand new collectors out there that really like these characters too. So these characters interest uh, newer collectors, which I'm sure there's some people watching the show that are, are, you know, newer comic book character fans, not just Bronze Age and Silver Age guys. 
Um, so I like this as a, as a new spec book. I like new comic books. I like reading some of these cool stories. And this is actually a pretty cool story. I did enjoy the story in this one. And with all the little first appearances and stuff that goes on in here, including the death of Captain Marvel, um, I think, you know, this book could see uh, a valuable rise. If it catches on with modern collectors, as well as the Bronze Age guys and the movie fans, uh, this book could, you know, definitely see a rise. So from 2020, um, look to pay around 25 to 30 bucks. And, you know, maybe 35. It's Captain Marvel, the end. Awesome. All right, so here we're gonna do Doctor Strange spec. Now this one's a little bit far outside and I have brought this book up before, but I think it's still, it's kind of fun because I think Sam Raimi is just the kind of kooky enough director to bring in these weird little characters like this somehow, right? Um, this book is from 1975 and it is Dead of Night, number 11. First appearance of Straw Man. Now I know it says Scarecrow here, um, he was his name was quickly changed into the in the next issue to become straw man I think they wanted to not be too confusing with the Batman character that was like pretty prominent at this time uh, so they changed his name to straw man he's referred to as the scarecrow in here in this book uh, <clears throat> like I said, he's a kind of one of these weird quirky characters he lives in a painting he's one of the lords of fear he has lots of ties to Schumann Garoth and nightmare despair uh, all those kinds of characters. He has big ties to Doctor Strange. Uh, he lives in a painting that was in the Sanctum San uh, the Sanctum Centorium uh, for a while in Doctor Strange's home. Um, Doctor Strange, you know, he's one of the guardians of the Earth that helps Doctor Strange uh, fight against the Fear Lords. I know he was a Fear Lord for a while, but he was like, you know, screw you guys, this is not cool. And he became a kind of a guardian uh, of the Earth from one of the... Uh, uh, from some of the fear lords being able to access earth right so he helps out uh, dr strange quite a bit and he is like i said he's very quirky lives in a painting made out of straw i don't even think he speaks he just telepathically talks to people of course he's susceptible to fire that's his big downfall and whatnot but interesting guy and um yeah like i said little things like this might make backgrounds appearances or weird little cameo appearance for a half a second or whatever who knows what's going to happen in that uh, Multiverse of Madness movie. They could go all kinds of different places. Uh, current prices that I was looking at on eBay, you can get really decent mid-grade copies of this book for around the $20 to $30 range. Um, if he does show up, this is like such an odd duck book to have. Um, I could see this one like shooting up in price quite a bit because availability of this book will be pretty limited, I think. Uh, it's good if you want to grab it now. I mean, it's a little bit far out there. I mean, who knows, right? Straw Man is not the most popular character. But we just said, like, they're going to be bringing in tons and tons of these little characters from all over the place to do different things. And it's not going to, you know, it's not just always going to be that A-list guy drop, right? They can't. There's too many characters, too many properties that they need to introduce to just have A-listers only, right? So... I think he's a pretty good uh, spec. I think he's a fun spec. I think he'd be a fun character to just get a little bit of in an actual MCU movie. Um, he does have, like I said, lots of ties with Doctor Strange and sort of the idea of where Doctor Strange is going with the Dark Hole and Shuman Garoth and stuff, if those type things are true. And yeah, we could very well see a little cameo or something of Straw Man. So, from 1975. Dead of Night, number 11. First appearance of the Straw Man. Look to pay $25 to $30 for a decent copy of that guy right now. Okay. Now this is actually my favorite one on the list today. Uh, number 5. I think it's a good spec. I think it has a lot of smart stuff going for it. And it is from 1986. X-Factor, number 4. First appearance of a character named Frenzy. Okay, there's Frenzy right there. Uh, so Frenzy has quite a long history. Um, she was, you know, first introduced here. Uh, oh, geez, what were those first X Factor team called? Eh, anyways, she goes on. She's ties in, in with Magneto, and uh, she has other ties that, like, Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. She was an X Men for a little while. She was. There's all kinds of stuff that uh, she has traveled around for in 
Um, her real name is Joanna Cargill. She kind of turns over a leaf. Like I said, she joined the X-Men. She ends up um, joining S.W.O.R.D., right? So she becomes S.W.O.R.D.'s uh, mutant character, superpower character, sort of agent, ambassador for mutants, right? To show that mutants are also interested in defending Earth uh, with S.W.O.R.D., right? And so she becomes a S.W.O.R.D. agent with, the, with them, with Abigail Brand. Uh, I really think that she would be a smart character, one of those really smart characters to help start easing in mutants, right? I don't, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to just be like, here's mutants, here's our A-list team, right? And have this big thing going on. I think to kind of, you want to bring that up to a slow boil with the mutants, right? Start building up inside there a little bit, not like go crazy, crazy slow, but also, you know, you know, give people a little time to adjust to the idea of it. Frenzy is a mutant. Um, her power, she's basically the female Luke Cage, right? Like she's got basically all the exact same powers as Luke Cage. Uh, she's higher intelligence. Like I said, she was an agent of, of S.W.O.R.D. All kinds of great stuff going on for Frenzy. I could very much see their um, Joanna Cargill uh, or Frenzy being introduced um, with S.W.O.R.D. in the Secret Invasion, right? As their superpower super powered agent entity cheap to do right you don't need a lot of cgi to make a character you know look as strong as as frenzy is um don't have to have you know fancy costumes she just looks absolutely normal as everybody else right um person of color woman she hit starts you know checking a bunch of those kind of you know pc boxes the dc's or the dc the disney is really um pushing into their movies that and, and, and rightly so i'm not saying anything about that and um i think frenzy's a great choice right here she's bad uh, but this was her first appearance this book is you know dirt cheap still five to ten dollar range for an absolutely mint condition probably find it cheaper than that i think i only paid three dollars for this one which is like super super nice um I've got a couple other copies of it somewhere and i'm just holding on to those ones just in case uh, Joanna Cargill does show up or Frenzy does show up and yeah I think it's a great pick here for uh, real cheap and you know we never know where stuff is going to go so many properties so much is going to happen in the next 10 years hopefully you know we'll all spec together on that one and I'll help you guys out and you can help me out people people are great in the comments recommending uh, spec books as well I really really appreciate when people do that so from 1986, it is X-Factor number four. First appearance of Joanna Cargill, a.k.a. Frenzy, Agent of Sword. Okay, so just one thing I just want to remind you guys, I said the Loki streaming show is really, really eminent. So we brought this book up not too long ago, so I'm not actually in, adding it into my five, but I just want to remind you guys, Fantastic Four, annual number 27, um... This is such a great book, right, from 1994. This is the first appearance of the Time Variance Authority, guys. And the Time Variance Authority first appearance is mislabeled all over the place. Thor 371 has the first appearance of Justice Peace. He doesn't even mention the Time Variance Authority. In 372, he's talking to Thor, telling him about the Time Variance Authority, but he never actually, the Time Variance Authority never makes an actual appearance in that comic book. It's not till they go here, Fantastic Four. There's a bunch of different timelines that go on with this. Um, they go into a, an alternate reality where the Time Variance Authority is run by Kang the Conqueror. Um, this also has the first appearance of Justice Might, Justice Truth, Justice Liberty. Um, it has the first appearance of Mr. Tesseract, who is one of the guys that help run the Time Variance Authority, sort of a bureaucrat guy. Uh, it has the first appearance of Mr. Al Alternity, um, who is the, uh, the head of the TVA, right? Uh, he is the big boss, the big, big cheese at the TVA. Um, this book has a lot of stuff going for it and it's still dirt cheap. I paid $3 for my mint condition copy. I went and looked on uh, eBay today. I was still finding some for under the $10 mark. Remember, there's always going to be people that are asking dumb money for it. Uh, don't go too crazy. I wouldn't pay any more. 10 bucks for this for like an absolute mint copy and you can find them really guys you can this was just a reminder right that loki show is coming up so there's going to be all kinds of crazy spec around that show and this one could uh you know very well be one of the ones that pop so 
a reminder at the end book, our sixth book, I guess, is uh, Fantastic Four number tw annual number 27 from 1994. Remember, we already specced on this recently, so I didn't really include it into the five. I just wanted to remind everybody that that would be a great Loki spec to pick up just because the show is so close. Okay, so that has been our undervalued five for this uh, episode. We will see you again next time. Just reminding you, Wednesdays are new comic book days, but every day is old comic book day. All right, this has been Mr. Miracle Comics. My name is Dave. We'll see you next video.